If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 44. The plan is to cover Psalm 44, 45, and 46 tonight. So we're going to only have about 15 minutes per psalm. So we're going to waste no time jumping in there. We're still looking at the psalms that are given to the sons of Korah. If you missed last Wednesday night, I would encourage you to go online and listen at least to the introduction so that you kind of see the significance of the sons of Korah writing these psalms. These, these individuals that come from this heritage of rebellion. And now they're these men of rich devotion to God. And these three psalms are no different. It says, to the chief musician for the sons of Korah, Miskil. So it's, it's a psalm of instruction. So there's something there for us to learn as well in this psalm. It's a psalm, and the title for our study tonight is A Nation Under Siege. A Nation Under Siege. We're going to see that they had a, a prosperous past, but now they have a painful present, but a positive prospect. Much like this country. We had a prosperous past, but right now we, we have a painful present, present. But we still have, like Israel, a positive prospect, depending on what we do. What we do. I'm currently reading in Zechariah. and The people ask Zechariah, is it time? Is it, is it time now? Is, is Messiah coming? Is his kingdom going to be established? And he doesn't really answer the question, but he gives them a question of his own. And he basically says, are you ready? Are you ready to repent? Are you ready to receive? And so, the story's still out for this nation. He says, we have heard with our ears, our fathers, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old. We've heard. Every opportunity I get to encourage fathers, we've got a few in here, some future fathers, hopefully, probably, possibly. Fathers, if you don't tell your sons and daughters what God has done in your past, they may not be following him in your future. We have heard, the psalmist says. We have heard, O oh God, our fathers have told us. They told us of the good old days. You ever hear people talk about the good old days? He says, how thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them, how thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. The psalmist says, Lord, they didn't get where they are by their own doing. They didn't win the battles that they've won by their own might. You did it. Your right hand did it. We know who sits at the right hand. He says, and it was because of your countenance. He said, Lord, we are where we are because you smiled on us. And I wonder tonight if you're sitting here if when you think of the face of the Father, you see a smile or a scowl. I wonder if you tonight, like Noah, find grace in the eyes of the Lord. He said, we didn't do this. I was sharing with someone before the service during practice that the Lord has me in an interesting place, a place that I have never, ever been in my life. <laughs> yes, ultimately it will be right now. It doesn't feel that way. 
I'm in this place where I thought I had things figured out. And I thought I, I knew how to do certain things, but then God took away all of my security blankets. And I'm the most uneasy that I've ever been in ministry. I'm the most uncomfortable that I've ever been. And this morning, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm reading in Zechariah, I'm part of my, my quiet time. And the Lord reminded me of a verse. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And it was as if the Holy Spirit whispered, Gordon, you are exactly where I want you to be. And I'm like, Lord, but that's not where I want to be. <laughs> but you're where I want you to be. So I'm in a different grade. I've been promoted to a new level, so pray for your pastor. But I know this is true, as the psalmist said, I am where I am today by his grace. He has positioned me, he has placed me where I am, and every victory that I've ever experienced, it's been because of him. It's because of his right hand, and the psalmist recognizes that. Verse 4, he says, Thou art my king, O God, command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee we will push down our enemies. The idea there in the Hebrew is, is a horned beast like an ox who would, who would push and horn its victim and then trample it down. Through you, that's what we will do. Through thy name, we will tread them under that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and has put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long, and praise thy name forever, Silah. The psalmist says, stop right there and think about that one. We boast in the Lord. If God would have kept me where I was, through the transition that I'm in, I would have figured out some way to do it. And I would have thought it was me. So sometimes the Lord just steps back. He never leaves us nor forsakes us, but he steps back and, and just kind of lets us feel it on our own feet for just a moment to realize it's not you. It's me. And so the psalmist says, these sons of Korah, as they worship before the Lord, they're saying, we're going to boast in you. You have given me all that I have. The marriage that I have, it's because of you. The children I have, it's because of you. The house I have is because of you. The income I have, the blessings I have, the health I have, everything that I have is because of you. I'm going to boast in you. I'm going to boast in you, he says. But then the psalm shifts. Look at verse 9. One word, but. We remember, Lord. We remember what we've been told. We've been told of the, the days of old, all that you've done. And we recognize that you have given us victory. You have fought our enemies. And we're going to triumph in you. But we've had a prosperous past, Lord. But right now, it's painful. The present is painful. But thou hast cast off and put us to shame. And go us not forth with our armies. You stayed in the camp, Lord. You left us in the battlefield. And the battle went sore against us. And we feel defeated. And we are ashamed, Lord. Thou makest us to turn back from our enemies. We're on the run. They which hate us spoil themselves. They take advantage of their victory. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat and hast scattered us among the heathen. We're, we're going to the slaughter, Lord. They're slaughtering us. We're being devoured. Thou sellest thy people for naught and dost not increase thy wealth by thy, their price. You've sold us out, Lord, and you didn't even make a profit. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. 
My confusion is continually before me. I don't understand, Lord, why? Why are we being defeated? Why have you left us in the battle? And the shame of my face hath covered me. I am ashamed of where we are. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee? Now, oftentimes in Israel's history, they found themselves in defeat because of their sin. I personally believe that's what's wrong with our nation tonight. We are experiencing defeat because of our sin. If you remember, Joshua has this great victory over Jericho. They go moving into Ai and the commanders and the soldiers say, ah, this is a little old city. We we, we don't have to have our whole army. Just send a few guys in there. We can wipe them out. We'll be back before lunch. Joshua sends them out and they get whipped. They come running back with their tails between their legs. And Joshua, like the psalmist, Joshua falls on his face. He says, Lord, why? Why am I losing? If tonight you feel like a loser, it's probably a good idea to go before the Lord and ask him why. If you feel like your winning streak is over, if you feel like you're losing, you're suffering loss, you're not living in victory, you need to seek the Lord. Why? Now for Joshua, the Lord answers because there's sin in the camp. And he deals with that sin and then they have victory. But notice the psalmist here says, all this has come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Lord, This is not because of our sin, at least we're not aware. We're not aware of anything that we've done that might cause this, but search us out, Lord. If if, if there is, let us know, the psalmist says. And then notice he says this, verse 22, Yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. We're just like sheep for the slaughter. They say, Lord, it's bad. And then notice, verse 23. The psalmist says, Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast not us not off forever. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercies. It's always because of his mercy's sakes. The psalmist realizes that everything they've had in the past was because of his mercy. And if they're going to have anything in the future, if they're going to get past this this painful present, it's going to be because the Lord's mercies. But notice verse 22. We're going to just kind of circle around that verse real quick, and then we're going to move on to the next psalm. I would encourage you to take some time to dig deeper into this psalm. Look at verse 22, yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That verse should seem very familiar to every one of you. It should ring ring a bell in your remembrance. It's, I've, I've heard that somewhere. And that somewhere we've recently studied. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. I'll start in verse 33. Paul says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen. Again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or notice the last thing he says, sword? 
the psalmist is writing about their defeat because of the sword. We're like sheep, counted for the slaughter. We we're killed all the day long, the psalmist says. And Paul, right here in, psalm, in Romans 8, reaches all the way back to Psalm 44. And he says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You may feel like tonight that you've just been left for the slaughter. That you're destined for defeat. That somehow the Lord has denied you. Or at best, he's delayed in helping you. But Paul doesn't stop there. Paul says, even if we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. What an if God does allow some defeats in my life? What if God does step back in the midst of the battle? And what if it doesn't have anything to do with my sin? Would that be okay? Would he still be God? Would I still worship him as such? Notice. Paul's talking about these little sheep that are in a bad situation. And he says, nay. And he's not horsing around. He says, nay, in all these things. In all these things. In every defeat. In every falter. In every falling down, in every trial, in every pain, in famine, in persecution, in peril, in sword, we're more than conquerors. Even when it looks like I'm defeated, even when it looks like I'm down for the count, I'm more. We're more. You're more than a conqueror, he says. Why is that? Because I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing the enemy can do to separate me from him. How can I be defeated when I'm with him? It doesn't matter what it looks like presently on the battlefield. We just need to cry out for his mercy. And we know that his mercies are what? New every morning. They're new every morning. And so the psalmist just leaves us there, anticipating this positive prospect. One might read this that doesn't know the Lord and think, oh, they're in trouble. God has left them high and dry. But the psalmist has cried out for God's mercy. And those who know him know he will not leave them there. He will not leave them there because he will allow nothing. Listen, he will allow nothing to come between you and himself. Nothing can pull you away from his love. Amen. Psalm 45 it says to the chief musician upon Shoshanim for the sons of Korah, another miskel, an instruction, a lesson here for us to learn. And notice it says a song of loves. You got to love a good love song. Well, you should. Some of you guys might be like, ah, I'm not into love songs. I used to not be into love songs, but the older I get and the further along with the Lord I get, the more I'm into love songs, especially this love song. Shoshanim is to the lilies, and it's speculated, it's assumed that this royal wedding that this psalm is about is, is about Solomon's wedding. Poetically, it describes that, but I believe prophetically, it describes the marriage of one that is greater than Solomon. Jesus said, a one greater than Solomon is here. We're going to see a rejoicing psalmist. 
then we're going to see a royal groom, a radiant bride, a regal procession. The Holy Spirit is so good. And then reigning offspring. This royal wedding. Last week, weekend, had the privilege of attending, some of you did as well, Dirk and Christina's wedding. It was a beautiful, beautiful wedding. Not this weekend, but the next, I have the privilege of attending another wedding, Lord willing, that of Miles. I call her Lainey. Get her permission before you call her that. Just saying. It's not special. Other people do too, but that's what I call her. But that wedding, I, I'm excited. To me, there's nothing like a marriage. It's a beautiful thing. It's one of the first things we see God do. There's other ones on the horizon too. But we'll, we'll wait until they get a little bit closer. But I love a wedding. And this psalm is beautiful. It's a beautiful psalm. We won't be able to spend enough time on it, but I would encourage you to spend some time meditating upon it, especially those, <clears throat> hint, hint, those of you who are in the process <clears throat> of getting married soon. It would be good for you. I, I unfortunately spent much of my marriage not being a husband. Oh, I was one in name, but not in reality. But as I got to know this bridegroom more, and the closer I got to him, the better husband I became. And the psalmist is thinking about this, and he says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. The psalmist says, I'm rejoicing. I'm overflowing. I'm so excited about what I'm talking about. Then he talks about this royal groom. He says, thou art fairer than the children of men. And he is. Jesus is more fair than any man ever in all of history. My bridegroom is the fairest of them all. He's the fairest of them all. Notice, grace is poured into thy lips. What beautiful poetry. Grace is poured into thy lips. I love to read his sweet somethings to me. I wouldn't dare call them sweet nothings. Because these are some sweet somethings here. But his grace just pours out of his lips. And Luke's gospel, it is said of the gracious words which he spake. In John 17, they come back to the rulers, the, the, the temple guards, and said, Never ever a man spake like this man. His words, his voice is the only one that makes my heart. Go pitter-patter. My bridegroom, his words are gracious. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. Jesus says, I only say those things that please my Father. Oh, wow. These gracious words, this glorious one. Notice this. His girded sword, verse 3. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible or awesome things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. When you shoot at a target, you always hit the mark. Whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. These two verses should sound familiar to you as well if you're a student of the New Testament because in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 and 9, the writer of Hebrews uses these words. His gracious words, his girded sword, his governing scepter, and his glad heart. Our Lord tonight is glad. He's been anointed with the oil of gladness. I hope you are glad. I hope. I'm tired. Okay, that's fine. You can be tired. But be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus is glad. Our bridegroom is glad at a future marriage. Like some of these young people, they're excited. They're making plans. They're having showers. They're getting apartments and they're buying stuff and they're getting gifts and all the rest. Our bridegroom is doing the same. In John chapter 14, he says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He's glad. He's glad. He sat at that last supper with his disciples. And he said, with desire, with great desire, have I desired to partake of this with you. And then he says, I will not drink of the vine again until that day in my father's kingdom. There's coming a day when I'm going to lift that cup. And the bride is going to be there. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm glad. Verse 8, all thy garments smell of myrrh and alloys and cassia. Out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. A repetition of glad. This bridegroom has these gracious words that just ooze off his lips. Girlfriend, your man had never talked to you like my man talks to me. I think about the song of songs, the song of Solomon, which many believers are uncomfortable about. I love that book because it describes what this psalm is forecasting, foretelling. There's coming a day when this, this longing that I've had, like these sons of Korah, this rich devotion, this deep devotion in my heart as we sang in worship, I'm falling in love with you. More and more I'm falling in love with you. And, and I come close to you and then there's times that I feel distant and I, I want to just search for you. Have you seen my beloved? Have you seen him? Where is he? Where is he? I just want to be with him. I want to be in his presence. I want to hear his gracious word. I want to be glad in his presence. And I want to smell that sweet aroma. Ladies, you got to love it when your man smells good. I mean, there's nothing worse than being with an old stinker. Right? But our bridegroom, there's this aroma about him. I'm reminded of John's gospel where Mary... Mary is there at a supper. They're rejoicing. They're, they're celebrating because her brother Lazarus was raised again. And she takes this pound of spike nard and she breaks this alabaster box. And she anoints his feet and washes them with her hair. And the Bible tells us that the room was filled with the aroma. It was filled with the aroma. And then Paul in Corinthians says that we are the aroma of Christ. There's a sweetness there's a sweetness of being next to him. 
I don't want to get too gushy, but I know sometimes a, a lady will wear her man's T-shirt. That the smell of that, his cologne will be on that shirt, and she's like, oh. Your garments smell as myrrh, alloys, cassia. In the Song of Solomon, he says, your name is like ointment poured out. When I hear just the mention of your name, oh, it takes me to another place. Just the mention of of the name Jesus. That sweetest name I know. We look at this groom and now the psalmist moves to the bride. Verse 9. King's daughters were among the honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. This harkens back to Genesis chapter 2, where we're instructed in marriage to leave and cleave. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And I believe it's the same for both. I don't believe it's just the man supposed to leave and cleave. I believe both are to leave and cleave. And a lot of marriages get in trouble because they don't leave. And I'm not talking about geographically. I'm talking spiritually. They do what this couple did. And that couple did. And that couple before them. And that couple before them. And that couple before them. And I believe a couple should come together with the Lord. They shouldn't be bringing all of this baggage whether good or bad. Because the truth is, if mom and dad's got something working, you got to figure out how to make it work for you. Just because it works for them doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. You got to work it out in your life. And so you leave and you cleave. And so let's bring this home spiritually. Some of us, maybe, hopefully not. It's Wednesday night crowd. Some of us may have not left. Psalm speaks of this, this, this radiant bride, and he says, leave your people, leave your people, leave your father's house, cleave to your bridegroom, cleave to him. Over and over again in the scripture, we're told to cleave unto the Lord. I'm reminded of Ruth, Ruth and Naomi. Orpha's there and the three of them and they're crying and they're weeping and Naomi says, I don't have any more sons and if I could have a husband right now and have children, you wouldn't wait around until they grew up anyway. Go back home. <laughs> Orpha cries and cries and then she walks off into the sunset. Naomi turns to Ruth and says, you need to go with your sister. She says, paraphrasing, I ain't going nowhere. Wherever you go, I'm going. Your people are going to be my people. Where you die, I'm going to die. Where you're buried, I'm going to be buried. I'm all in, Ruth says. And the whole city heard about this woman. We need to leave and cleave to our Lord. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. There's a greater desire for those who leave and cleave. He doesn't show favoritism, but a relationship is a relationship, let's be honest. Could not have any of the disciples laid at his bosom at the table? He would not have refused any of them. Yet John, the beloved, that disciple whom Jesus loves, was there. Just saying, you can be as close to him as you want. Just like couples, they can be as close as they want to be. Do you want to invest the time? Do you want to put forth the effort? For he is thy Lord and worship thou him. 
And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. And this gift you won't get tired of. I gotta keep you guys. It's Wednesday. I gotta keep you there. I gotta keep you there. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee with gladness. There's that word again. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children. The fruit that's going to come from this relationship is going to cause you to forget about your past, the psalmist says. Who may make us, or will make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. This, this radiant bride oh, in this relationship, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, I, I'm really speaking to you about a mystery. I'm talking to you about husbands and wives, but I'm really not talking about husbands and wives. He says, I'm really, I'm really taking you deeper. I'm trying to get you to see something greater. I'm talking about Christ and his church. He's, he's wanting to present her without spot and blemish. As the psalmist describes her in this needlework in her garment, in Revelation 19, we're, we're told, blessed is he that comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And she is robed in white. And that is the righteousness of the saints, clothed in his righteousness, smelling of his aroma. Because she's been with him. She spent time with him. She's listened with longing to his gracious words. She has rejoiced with gladness because of his anointing. Oh. No wonder Paul says in Thessalonians, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. How you doing, Gordon? Hanging in there. Is it that bad? Well, I guess it could be worse, but it's pretty bad. No. I'm going to a wedding. I'm being fitted right now. Oh, you ought to see my dress. Nobody laughs when I... It must be weird to some people that the pastor's up here talking about being a bride, but I'm glad about it. I'm happy about it. Because I have never, ever, ever, listen, I've never been loved like this before. I am amazed that he chose me. This man could have any woman he wanted. He could have the pick, the cream of the crop. And somehow, for some reason, he looked through the crowd and his eyes caught my eyes. And I have never been the same. Never been the same. And I can't wait for that day. I'm going to see him in all of his glory. Oh. Mm. Well, Psalm 46. <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit too excited here. <laughs> to the chief musician, again. For the sons of Korah, again. And this one, though, a song upon Alamoth. There's differences of opinion among scholars what this means. Some believe it's, it's, it's an instrument that's high strung. Others believe that this psalm is to be sung in a high key, a soprano, maybe even a female choir. In other words, the idea is sing this one in the rafters. Raise the roof with this a mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress. We have an immovable fortress. 
an inexhaustible river and an invincible ruler. Look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Dear saint, are you troubled tonight? He's present. If you didn't have any other reason to rejoice in the midst of your troubles, this is it. He's with you. Right there. Presently with you. And even though in Psalm 44, they felt like God had cast them off, they felt like God had forsaken them, He hadn't. He doesn't. He won't. He will not. He will never leave us nor forsake us. God is our refuge, our strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be moved? It's pretty serious. Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Sounds scary. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, the psalmist says, stop. Shh. Think about this. Even if all of this happens, we won't fear because the Lord is our refuge. He's our hiding place. He's our shelter in the midst of the storm. Not only that, he says, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. No doubt referencing Jerusalem, but what's interesting is there is no great river in Jerusalem. In days of old and even today, most cities are established near water sources because water is life and without water, you're in trouble. We talked about that Last week, as the heart panteth after the water, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. But God established Israel not near a great river. And yet the psalmist talks about this river, but he's not the only one. Ezekiel talks about a river. Jeremiah talks about a river. In the book of Revelation, we read about a river. Jesus talks about a river within in John chapter 7. It's a beautiful picture. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make, there's that word again, glad. Shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. I've always found it interesting. I got saved in a charismatic church and I spent a lot of my early Christian walk around charismatic people. And yet this river the psalmist says, makes glad. And a lot of them are glad. A lot of those who claim we are spirit-filled, we have the fullness. Can't you see it? Oozing from my life. There's a river, the streams whereof make glad. Remember, now in our last psalm, we were almost there. Tune in, stay tuned. He was anointed with gladness above his brethren. I'm convinced Jesus was the gladdest man that ever walked planet Earth. And I still believe God is glad. He is a happy God. He's also a holy God. And we were talking about the bride real quick. Just remember, pause, stop. Holiness brings happiness. Sin brings sadness. Holiness brings happiness. God is holy. He's got no reason to be sad. And if I'm truly his, and I am, I don't either. There's a river. There's a river in Jesus. Says, Those that believe on him, out of his belly shall flow rivers, endless torrents of living water. And Ezekiel talks about this in 47. He says, I waded out. There was this river that came from the temple, from the throne. He says, I waded out a little bit to my ankles. 
The man measured a little more and I got to my knees and he measured a little more and I got to my loins and he measured a little more, more and I got to where I couldn't pass this river. It was over my head. He goes on to say that everywhere that river goes, it brings life. In the book of Revelation, Revelation 22 talks about a river as well. And the trees thereof make glad the people of God. And their, their leaves and fruit are for the healing of the nations. This life-living torrent that the Lord desires to flow from us. God is in the midst of her. Verse 5, she shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. Paraphrase. He ain't going to waste no time doing it. Speaking of Ruth and Naomi, after Ruth just happened, I love the King James. It says she hap, she happed upon a field that was owned by Boaz. I, I love the hap that God brings into my life. The happenings, they make me happy. Because I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. I just happen to have what I need. I just happen to come through it all. I just happen to win in the end. And he's doing all of this in my life. Because God's in the midst. So when Ruth comes back with a little bit of stuff to eat, Naomi says to Ruth, where have you been, my daughter? And she tells of Boaz and she says, oh my, he's a near of kin. And he says, to, she says to Ruth, don't rest, don't wait, be still because he's going to make it right and he's going to do so quickly. God is never, ever late. You say, well, Gordon, it seems like never late, never late. His delays Are never late. Hmm. Well, verse six. The heathen raged; the kingdom, kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice; the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. This is the second time that God, being our refuge, is mentioned, and this is the second time the psalmist says, "Stop." And let that sink in. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. And breaketh the bow. He cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. And since he does all this, the psalmist says, be still and know. That he is God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Do you know what that be still means in the Hebrew? It literally means to take one's hands off. You know that death grip you got on your life? Well, let me just speak for me. That I have on my life and God's just prying my fingers off right now as I speak. He's saying, be still, Gordon. I'm trying to be still. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. And no. Oh. The world didn't fall apart when I let go, Lord. Matter of fact, I think things are getting better. Be still and know that I am God. And then he says it for the third and final time. Verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob. I'm so glad when I come across the God of Jacob in the scripture. Sometimes he says the God of Israel, but Israel speaks of the goodness of his people when they're, when they're behaving the way they're supposed to because Israel means governed by God, but Jacob on the other hand. The God of Jacob is with us. So if you're here tonight and you're thinking, well, I've kind of blown it. I've had an attitude lately and I haven't been doing what I ought to do and God's probably done with me. No, he's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Jacob. And he is our refuge. And then he says, if you didn't hear him the first two times, Selah, stop. Think about that. 
He's your refuge. Let go. Let God. Amen? Quick review. Psalm 44. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with present defeat. It doesn't matter if you feel like God has forsaken you and you can't figure out why that is. You feel like we're sheep for the slaughter. Nay. In all these things, we're more than conquerors. And it doesn't matter how bad life is. There's a date on the calendar. Now, you don't know the date. I don't know the date. We don't know the date. But the Father knows the date. There's coming a day when he's going to say to the Son, it's time. And I can't wait for that day, that happy reunion, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's coming, and I believe it's going to be soon.